Hi everyone, welcome to the weekly chapter by chapter recap of our assigned Bible reading. My name is Corey Babechko and I work with Bible Discovery and Bible Discovery TV. We're taking you through the Bible in a year and today our assigned reading for this week covers Proverbs chapter 1 to 24. So these are the verses and the chapters that we are going to be attempting to survey, to look at today. And I'm not sure how it's going to go. Proverbs are a collection of wise sayings. So it doesn't lend itself naturally to being recapped. But we're going to try our best. We're going to try to get you caught up on your weekly reading so that you can start fresh in Proverbs chapter 25 tomorrow. Okay. Let's do this. Proverbs chapter one. So this chapter is an introduction to the book of Proverbs. And the first seven verses of chapter one actually identify the author, which turns out to be Solomon, the son of King David. So King Solomon, notorious and famous King Solomon. And it also gives us the purpose for the entire book of Proverbs, which is to gain wisdom, to receive instruction, to give prudence and understanding to the reader that, you know, applies themselves to understanding the the text. And it also gives us the assumption or the premise that the book of Proverbs is established on. It's predicated on this. So that is that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So fools being people who do not believe in God or treat life as if God did not exist. So in order to reap the benefits of wisdom and knowledge and understanding, Solomon is saying here, you have to begin with the fear of God. You have to begin with that reverential respect that comes with recognizing that there is a creator God that is bigger than you, that has purposes that you may not be able to fully understand. And that at the end of the day, has authority over all created things. So the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So that premise, that assumption is laid out flat in the first seven verses of Proverbs for us. Okay, so then it's still in chapter one. There's a kind of prologue to the book uh, for the rest of chapter one. First, it addresses the son in the context of home. So this whole book is written as if Solomon is passing on wisdom to his son. So in the context of him being home, it says this, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction and do not forsake your mother's teaching. And the point of this section ends up being not to go along with sinful men, but to resist the urge to join sinful men. Verses 18 to 19 says, these men lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush only themselves. Such are the paths of all who go after ill-gotten gain. It takes away the life of those who get it. So in other words, this seems like a good idea to take shortcuts in life, but it's not a good idea. Okay, then the chapter moves from the context of a son at home to the context of wisdom calling aloud in the public square, on the top of the wall, on this at the city gate. So the context is now in the public sphere rather than just at home. And the point of this wisdom section is that wisdom is rebuking the people for their hatred of knowledge. And she wants them to repent so that she can teach them a better way, teach them amazing things. So the overall thrust of Proverbs chapter one, and I know there's a lot in there, uh, but the overall thrust of it is to resist evil men and evil things and embrace wisdom. And this is going to be a recurrent theme of the book of Proverbs. Okay, Proverbs 2, we are still in this parental instruction. We're going to see it throughout the entire book of Proverbs. Chapters opening with my son. Uh, So this chapter is all about if you seek wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, you will understand the fear of the Lord and you will find the knowledge of God. So there's 
effort here. You have to seek and you have to apply your heart to understanding, okay? So then the benefits of wisdom here in chapter two are listed. Things like success, protection, knowing justice and fairness, actually knowing what those things are and having confidence in it. So having discretion that will guard your life, uh, that will save you from wicked and devious men. So people who seem like they're good news, but they're actually bad news. And they will save you from the adulterous woman. Again, something that looks like it's going to be indulgent and pleasurable, but ends up in death. Essentially, the benefits of wisdom are a good life. Proverbs chapter three, here there's a series of objectives and their results are listed. So um, let me explain that a little bit more. For example, it says to let love and faithfulness never leave you. Make sure that you're living in love. Make sure that you're being a faithful person. By doing so, you will win favor and a good name, both with men and more importantly, with God. And then there's another objective. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to God and he will make your paths straight. So we're all, Old Testament, New Testament, we're all to live a life in submission to God and his ways. This is not a popular teaching. It wasn't a popular teaching then. It's not a popular teaching now, but this is the teaching of the wisdom literature of the Bible and of the gospel. You know, Romans 12, offer yourselves a living sacrifice. Uh, So submit to God. Another one, don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will be health and nourishment to your body. Uh, Another one is honor the Lord with your wealth. So this is another objective in Proverbs 3. Make sure that you're honoring God with your wealth and you will have good harvests. Uh, Don't despise God's discipline uh, because God's discipline means that he loves you. And then uh, after all of these objectives and their results, these goals and their results, then there's a section talking about wisdom again and all of its benefits. Proverbs chapter four, the value of wisdom. That's what this is all about. And essentially, it's so valuable, you need to get it at you know, any cost, work for it, work for wisdom. Uh, Verses three to seven, I wanna read this to you. For I too was a son of my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Then he taught me and he said to me, take hold of my words with all your heart, keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will protect you. Love her and she will watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. So this chapter establishes that wisdom is life. Wisdom equals life and foolishness is death. Verse 13 actually says, hold on to instruction. Don't let it go. Guard it well for it is your life. So the way that we act, the way that we orient the goals of our life equals the results of our lives. It just makes sense. Proverbs chapter five, this whole chapter is a warning against adultery. It highlights the dangers and the evil of illicit sexual behavior. Uh, Verses 21 to 23 say this, For your ways are in full view of the Lord, and he examines all your paths. The evil deeds of the wicked ensnare them. The cords of their sin hold them fast. For lack of discipline, they will die, led astray by their own great folly. And what we learn through this chapter is that the way of following God has always involved self-denial. Pick up your cross daily and follow me. It involves self-denial. Things may seem like a good idea, but actually the cords of your sin bind you and hold you down and drag you down to death. 
Proverbs chapter 6 contains help for when you're dealing with various situations, and specifically this princely son of King Solomon. So, for example, when you're trapped in a foolish situation, get out and don't rest until you're out. Don't be lazy. Don't be a troublemaker. And of course, there's reasons for this in the text. I'm just summarizing it really quickly. There's also a list of seven things that God hates. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a person who stirs up conflict in a community. And uh, a lying tongue and a false witness who pours out lies seem similar, but the context is a bit different. So a false witness would be someone who's brought in as a witness to you know, testify for or against someone. So a false witness would be trying to get someone who is innocent in trouble or trying to get someone who is guilty out of trouble. So don't go against justice at that point. So that's what that one is talking about. And then at the end of Proverbs 6, another uh, long warning against adultery. Proverbs chapter 7, this one is where adultery kind of takes on a personification. So it's a warning against the adulterous woman. So this chapter provides a, a character foil for Lady Wisdom. We met Lady Wisdom personified early on in Proverbs. You know, wi Wisdom, she stands in the streets and calls out. She goes on the wall. She stands in the gate, all of these things. So Lady Wisdom has already been personified. And now folly, sin, wickedness is going to be personified as the adulterous woman. Uh, so the adulterous woman or folly roams through the streets looking for victims in this chapter. And uh, also interesting is the bond, the, the familial bond that's brought up by the author here. So it, uh, early on in chapter 7 it says wisdom is your sister. So in other words, and later on it, uh, it will be called your mother. So uh, it's your blood, your ally, your partner, right? And folly is the adulterous woman. So folly is your lover who makes you feel good, but it's all lies and it will result in your death. So this there's this very strong character foil. Now, moving on to Proverbs chapter 8, we see wisdom personified again and her work in the streets, which is vastly different than Folly's work in the street. So this time wisdom is imagined as the mother. Uh, so earlier it was the sister, now it's the mother. Uh, with And with God at the creation of mankind. Uh, it's So verses 32 to 36 say this, it's wisdom, now, wisdom speaking. Now then, my children, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. For those who find me find life and receive favor from the Lord. But those who fail to find me harm themselves. And all who hate me love death. Proverbs chapter 9. So wisdom and folly, this theme, this personification is continued, but this time they are directly compared. So wisdom is a woman who has built up her house, who has prepared a meal and invites all the simple to come in and get wise, become not simple any longer. And folly then sits at the door of her house, inviting, tempting the simple to come in and die. Proverbs chapter 10. Now this opens up the Proverbs of Solomon. So these, it's a collection of wise sayings. Um, this chapter aims, from what I can tell, it aims to contrast what wisdom looks like in real life against what foolishness looks like. So it gives us some practical examples. Uh, verse 11 says, The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. Uh, and I chose this one to highlight because there are actually 10 different proverbs in chapter 10 that talk about the mouth, the lips, the speech 
of people, both righteous and wicked. And we see a very marked difference between what should be coming out of the mouth of the righteous and what naturally comes out of the mouth of the wicked. So that's person that's exemplified here. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life, but the mouth of the wicked conceals violence. It hides violence in there. It's not a fountain of life. It's a fountain of death. Proverbs chapter 11. There's a lot of consequences in this one, good consequences and bad consequences, the natural outworking of wisdom and folly. So verse two says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Uh, or verse 17, those who are kind benefit themselves, but the cruel bring ruin on themselves. And I also really like verse 28, those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green leaf. So, you know, I've given a few examples of what happens when you're prideful versus when you're humble, uh, what happens when you're kind uh, versus cruel, and what happens when you trust in yourself and your wealth versus what happens when you trust in God. So there's a lot of consequences, good and bad, in Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs 12, more descriptions of the righteous life and the wicked life. I want to just give you some of them here. Verse 1, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge, but whoever hates correction is stupid. This was a favorite one of my dad's when I was growing up. Thanks for that, dad. <laughs> no, it's actually very instructive because, uh, you know, we can get our we can kind of get our backs up when someone points out a mistake that we make, but it's a bad attitude. We, whoever loves discipline loves knowledge. We want to be having the right attitude, wanting to get better. Verse 16, fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. How this contrasts with our world and our culture today Let's just read that again. Fools show their annoyance at once, but the prudent overlook an insult. Verse 24 says this, The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. So there's a lot of lofty goals for the mouth, the words, the tongue, the speech of the righteous. And we can definitely see, you know, if you've already read your Bible, if you're familiar with the New Testament, the book of James in the New Testament talks a lot about the power of the tongue and how life and death are in the power of the tongue and how, uh, you know, we have to get control of our tongue and our words and what we say. And you can see so clearly when you read through the Proverbs how he was really leaning heavy on the wisdom literature of the Proverbs. Okay, Proverbs chapter 13, another one, verse 3, those who guard their lips preserve their lives, but those who speak rashly will come to ruin. Uh, or how about this one? I really like this one, verse 10, where there is strife, there is pride, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Uh, again, sometimes it's hard to hear advice, but we need to be teachable. This is a theme that shows up over and over and over in Proverbs. We need to be teachable people and consider the rebuke and the correction and the suggestions of people around us. Some of them may be good, some of them may be bad, but we need to be self-reflective and consider it. Uh, verse 18, whoever disregards discipline comes to poverty and shame, but whoever heeds correction is honored. Are we teachable? Do we listen to people in our lives? Uh, and I think verse 20 can help us in this endeavor as well. It says, walk with the wise and become wise for a companion of fools suffers harm. So this is that whole choose your friends wisely thing. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 8, I wanted to highlight, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. 
So we need to be self-reflective people. We can't just live how we want to live and deceive ourselves and just pretend that everything is fine. We need to give thought to our ways, reading the word of God, uh, having meaningful conversations with the Christians in our lives and being self-reflective about our lives. Verse 12 uh, also highlights why we need to do this. There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end, it leads to death. And verse 16, the wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. So there's a call for temperance and caution and wisdom and thinking all throughout the Psalms. I mean, Proverbs. <laughs> Proverbs 15, uh, verses 1 and 2 says this. It's one of my favorites. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Uh, and verse 2 says, The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. What jumped out to me there is that adorns word. The tongue of the wise adorns knowledge. It beautifies knowledge. It makes knowledge sound good, right? But the mouth of the fool gushes folly. So there's some lofty goals here for us that I still definitely am working on. Verses 16 and 17. Better a little with the fear of the Lord, than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fatted calf with hatred. So again, the point of this proverb is not popular in our society today. We have rights to fight for, you know, to be content is not in fashion. We should not be content. We have to push and push and push. And there's a time for pushing. That's not what I'm saying. There's a time for fighting uh, and for challenging cultural beliefs. There is a time for that. But better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fatted calf with hatred. Proverbs 16 verses 1 to 4 relate to the theme of the plans of mankind. So uh, to humans belong the plans of the heart, but from the Lord comes the proper answer of the tongue. All a, way, all a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and he will establish your plans. The Lord works out everything to its proper end even the wicked for the day of disaster. So this is cut this is just a, a teaching on the plans of mankind and the plans of God and how they're different and how they go together. Proverbs 17 verse 5. Whoever mocks the poor shows contempt for their maker. Whoever gloats over disaster will not go unpunished. So this is an attitude problem. We shouldn't be gloating over disaster for anyone because God made whoever's perishing in that disaster, whoever's suffering from that disaster, even if they brought it on themselves with their own wickedness, God made them. And so to mock them is to show contempt for their maker. It's a bad attitude. Verse 9, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Ugh. I remember being teenage me reading this, and this one cut me to the core uh, because this is a part of drama, you know, when some you have someone wrongs you in some way and then you work it out between the two of you but it's so tempting then when you're talking with a family member or talking with another friend to be like guess what happened this week and they did this to me and it's fine but can you believe they did this that's drama and it has no place it's unwise drama whoever would foster a love covers over an offense but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends and then this this nugget 
This golden nugget, verse 28 of Proverbs 17. Even fools are thought wise if they keep silent and discerning if they hold their tongues. Proverbs 18, verse 2. Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in airing their own opinions. Ouch. This is just so much of this speaks to our culture because it's just speaking to human nature. Clearly humans were the same during the time period of Solomon, just airing their own opinions left, right, and center, just as we do in our society today. Verse 13, to answer before listening, that is folly and shame. Okay, I wanna move on to Proverbs 19. I wanted to highlight verse two. Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? Desire without knowledge is not good. How much more will hasty feet miss the way? See, we have to spend time building up our knowledge. Passion is not enough. In the Christian life, passion is not enough. We have to build up our knowledge base. And the Proverbs have told us this over and over. There is a way that seems right to a man, that seems right to us, but its way is death. We can be so passionate about God and be running in the opposite direction from him. Passion is not enough. It needs knowledge because how much more will hasty feet miss the way? Verse 3 is related. A person's own folly leads to their ruin, yet their heart rages against the Lord. Now, this proverb isn't saying that every person who comes to ruin has got there because of their own foolishness. Uh, instead, it's kind of say, it, it's saying something completely different. It's saying that when a foolish person gets what they deserve, They'll never blame themselves. They'll blame God because they're foolish. So nothing is their fault. They won't be self-reflective. They'll just blame a higher power. Okay, verse 27 says, Stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. Someone told me once that they had gone to church all their lives. They had read the Bible once from cover to cover, and they had even grown up with a parent who worked in um, Christian ministry. So therefore, they didn't need to read the Bible anymore because they already knew it. This is a mistake, which I'm sure you all know if you're watching this recap because you're trying to read the Bible. It's a mistake because Proverbs says, stop listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. We are almost there. Proverbs 20, just a few more chapters. Proverbs 20. So verse 23 of Proverbs actually occurs a few places in the book of Proverbs. And it occurs twice here in chapter 20. It says this, The Lord detests differing weights and dishonest scales do not please him. So in other words, God values honesty and fairness and he rejects lying and greed. So we must not be partial or show partiality or favoritism to people. Uh, and we must not be self-seeking, trying to get rich, trying to get greedy, trying to be better than everyone else. Has no place. Proverbs chapter 21. Okay, so often in Proverbs and the rest of the Bible for that matter, when you come across something that you're not clear on, you need to keep reading because often it will be clarified later on in the chapter. And there's an example of this in Proverbs 21. So verse 17 says, Whoever loves pleasure will become poor. Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich. But that seems a little strange, doesn't it? Whoever loves wine and olive oil will never be rich? You can't love olive oil and a, and a nice glass of wine? What's going on? Verse 20, a few verses down, clarifies. It says, The wise store up choice food and olive oil, but fools gulp theirs down. So 
whoever loves pleasure and whoever loves wine and olive oil, that's like they're just consuming it. They're just partying hard. They're just, they're not storing any for the off season. So this is all about managing yourself, managing your desires, managing your household well. Proverbs 22, this starts out like every other chapter in Proverbs with sayings, but then it introduces a section called the 30 sayings of the wise. And um, these more these 30 sayings of the wise, six of them are recorded in chapter 22. And most of the time, most of these have a few lines to them rather than just the one line of the average size proverb that we've been reading. Um, <clears throat> the saying number one is kind of an intro saying and saying number two is basically protecting the poor. The point of saying three is don't be friends with a hot tempered person and it explains why. Saying number four basically says stay away from debt. And saying five says, do not move an ancient boundary stone, which clicks into, it ties into how Israel was a nation that was divided up according to tribal inheritances. And saying number six has to do with skilled workers, workers who work on developing their skill will advance. Okay, Proverbs chapter 23 uh, records these 30 sayings of the wise numbers 7 through 19. And I'll just read you one of them to give you a flavor for it in case you didn't get a chance to read Proverbs 23 this week. Saying 7 is, when you sit to dine with a ruler, note well what is before you and put a knife to your throat if you're given to gluttony. Do not crave his delicacies for that food is deceptive. Okay, so that put a knife is basically like, don't eat too much, just keep your head up, don't, don't be gluttonous. So the idea behind this is perhaps this ruler is testing your character or trying to bribe you, you know, he's fattening you up and treating you well, whining and dining, and then he's gonna want some sort of military action for you. Remember, this is King Solomon talking to his prince son who will one day likely be king or at least a noble. Proverbs chapter 24, this is the last one we're going to be recapping today. This is, it holds sayings 20 to 30, uh, plus then after the 30, it moves on to further sayings of the wise. Uh, saying number 28, I wanted to read to you. It says, do not gloat when your enemy falls. When they stumble, do not let your heart rejoice or the Lord will see and disapprove and turn his wrath away from them. So don't gloat when your enemy falls. Uh, and then verses 30 to 34 says this. Uh, these are the further sayings of the wise that are a little bit longer and more involved. Here's what I mean. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. So these are more reflections, wisdom from reflections of Solomon. Um, so overall, the book of Proverbs so far has given us what wisdom looks like in life versus what foolishness looks like in life. So this is a book to do a lot of self-reflection with, to sit with and to think about um, and foster that self-reflection and self-evaluation that was always a part of following God, always a part of following the creator of the universe, and still is as we get into the New Testament, we're going to be seeing some of these very similar principles expounded on in the New Testament. Okay, you guys, we did it. Proverbs 1 through 24. We're going to finish up Proverbs, Proverbs next week and move into some of the other wisdom literature before we jump into the books of the prophets. I love the prophets, the Old Testament prophets. 
It wasn't always that way. I used to be intimidated by them, but now I love them. So I am excited to get to them. How are you guys doing in your Bible reading? Do you have any favorite Proverbs? Um, or do you have any questions about what you read this week? Pop them in the comments below and I'll see what I can do to help you out. I, I love commenting back to you guys and reading all your comments. Uh, it makes a really fun weekend and week for me. I hope you guys are having a good one and I'll see you next time.